BuzzFeed has seemingly abandoned its major YouTube channels, closed down its Pulitzer Prize winning news department, fired a ton of staff, gone from a share price of $10 down to 25 cents, and is now using AI to generate quizzes and articles. They're also attempting to move into the film industry. It's a bold move. But let's see if it pays off. I'm Todd Boyer, and I watched every single BuzzFeed Studios film, from Fall to One True Loves to The Black Demon to Xmas. I've done them all. Now, most people don't know that BuzzFeed has made a move into movies. I myself didn't know until pretty recently. I keep getting recommended clips of the movie Fall on my TikTok. This has been happening every couple of months since the film came out. And when I finally decided to look it up, I was very surprised to see that one of the production companies that worked on it was BuzzFeed Studios. If for some crazy reason you stumbled upon the BuzzFeed YouTube channel any time of the last year, you would see that pretty much all the content that they've uploaded has been trailers, or behind the scenes, or cast interviews, or various marketing materials of films that BuzzFeed themselves has developed. Also some cat food commercials, I, I guess. That'll actually be kind of relevant later, later on. You will also notice a steep decline in views. They're not comparable to where they were at a couple of years ago where they were generating, you know, millions every video. Obviously a lot of the major on-screen talent has left at this point. Series like Worth It, Try Guys, Unsolved have all ended for some time. Because why would the creatives behind those work for a salary for a big company when they could work independently and, you know, <laughs> Get, get all the money themselves. It just wouldn't make logical sense for them to keep doing that. Channels like As Is and Multiplayer, which have 10 million subscribers each, now haven't had an upload since 2022. And uploads on channels like Unsolved or Pero Like or Tasty have uploads very few and far in between. Channels like BuzzFeed Celeb are pretty actively still used, which makes sense. A, a channel like that is really only used to make promotional material. But the main BuzzFeed channel seems to be dedicated to advertising their own BuzzFeed Studios content. So I did some research into this content that they've been making and wow, oh my goodness, what a catalog. They've made all kinds of stuff over the last couple of years, like TV shows and documentaries and, and a Hot Ones game show. I'm surprised I'd never heard of that. But what interested me the most were the films, because there are some truly fascinating choices here. For some of these films have actually used existing properties that they already own to expand and explore in a feature film length premise. So think about it like what Disney does for Marvel characters. While Disney might make a film about Ant-Man, BuzzFeed might make a full length romantic comedy feature film based on a viral dog food commercial they made nine years ago. This is not a joke, the film Puppy Love is legitimately based off their video Puppyhood. Another example of this is Dear David, which is a horror film they made based off a tweet an employee made in 2017. Anyway, I decided to go ahead and marathon every single film that BuzzFeed Studios has ever made. That is 11 films they've released from 2021 to present day. That is one horror, two thrillers, two comedies, and six romantic comedies. I'm not doing any of the documentaries or shows. I'm not a crazy person. I'm just doing the full-length narrative-driven films, which unfortunately does mean no Snoop and Martha's very tasty. Halloween. I don't recommend that anyone out there does this. This was a terrible experience and they're definitely not meant to be marathons so you'll notice at points I may be more or less critical on these films depending on where my headspace was at the time. I also generally do not like romantic comedies but I love horror films so you know take this into consideration as well. I'm not like a film critic I'm just some dude with preferences. This is also not going to be some kind of BuzzFeed takedown video. I don't really you know have a problem with BuzzFeed as a whole. I legitimately went into this wanting to try and enjoy my experience as much as I could. There will be some spoilers for these films, but if I'm about to give away anything major, I uh, will let you know. There's also going to be chapters so you can jump around and stuff like that. A lot of these films are really low budget, so I'm not going to be critical of that aspect. I think that fantastic stories can be told on a budget of next to nothing. All of these films, except for maybe one or two of them, were released straight to streaming as well. So take for that what you will. A lot of them are filmed in similar areas of America. Most of them feature characters who work in tech or are influencers. There's a couple of recurring actors and there is a whole hell of a lot of product placement. There's even several movies that are legitimately advertising BuzzFeed itself. You could probably make a drinking game out of this marathon if it didn't go for 18 hours. Now without further ado, let's just get into this. I watched every BuzzFeed Studios film, so you don't have to. So the first film I wanted to watch was Puppy Love. That is the previously mentioned 2023 romantic comedy based on a series of viral advertisements from 2015. All right, we're gonna start film number one. 
Puppy love. Let's freaking go, baby. This film stars Lucy Hale and Grant Gustin, who you might know from The Flash. Co-directed by Nick Fabiano, who is the original creator of the Puppyhood series on the BuzzFeed channel. As well as Richard Allen Reed, who is the head of studio at BuzzFeed, but also the executive vice president of global content at BuzzFeed, HuffPost, and Complex Networks. So this dude has a lot on his plate. But he's got enough time to help a couple of kooky characters fall in love. Let's meet him now. So the opening shot of this film sets up not only this movie, but probably every movie we're gonna watch really well. Here's some very egregious product placement of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Literally the opening shot. Uh, this person is Nicole. She is a bit of a grub. She's so closed off to the point where she can't even get her boyfriend's name right. Capable of loving anyone. Hey, Emma, can we just like- That's not even my name. Hey, it's Chaim. Okay, Chaim. Of course, he here subsequently breaks up with her. Uh, they keep trying to play up how disgusting her living situation is, when in reality, it is probably the nicest apartment I've ever seen. It's gorgeous. I, I'd, bl I'd bloody live here. Also existing in the world is Max. He's on the opposite end of the spectrum here. He is a nervous wreck. He's at risk of being fired from his job because he struggled to return to work after the COVID restrictions were lifted. His therapist, who is so frustratingly bad, suggests that he gets a dog to solve all these problems. If you can talk to a dog and make an emotional connection, it can help you learn how to connect with people. I don't have a problem with a dog. I don't have a problem with a dog. What? So he adopts his dog named Chloe, and then he proceeds to accurately recreate the original puppyhood video. If you want to change anything, that's fine. Just run it by me first. Well, hey, if you, if you want to change anything, that's fine. You know, just if you run it by me first, if that's cool. Should I call you King Charles? Queen Charles. So what do I call you? King Charles or Queen Charles? Chloe. I kind of like the sound of that. What do you think about uh, Chloe? That's actually really beautiful. It's not bad. Like, I don't... I don't, I don't know why the hell they did this. I don't know who this is for. Like, the original ad had, like, a pretty improvisational tone, so it feels weird that they would recreate it. Like, I don't I don't get who this is for. I don't think there's any long-term fans of the Puppyhood videos who were just, like, screaming, pointing at their screens when this happens. I don't know. It seem, seems weird to me. Nicole also finds a stray dog outside of her home, which she, she adopts. She's hammered at the time. She names this dog Channing Tatum because that is funny. There's a lot of montages in this of dog-based relatable comedy. It feels very 2015 BuzzFeed. There's so many segments in this film that have the exact vibe of the original ad. Anyway, our two main characters end up matching on Bumble after the, the dog matches them on Bumble. Shout out, to, shout out to Bumble. But she likes to party and he likes to go to bed at nine. They're never gonna work out. How are they gonna get along? Well, uh, they don't. They go on a date and it's really awkward. We're also meant to believe that Grant Gustin isn't super conventionally attractive. Like every single character just tries to bring him down the whole time. Ooh, she's way out of your league, dude. Yeah, man, thank you, I know that. This dude is, is freaking. this is a very conventionally attractive man. Yeah, so they end up going on a date and they're walking their dogs and all over it is terrible. They're not having a good experience. But, oh no, where have the dogs gone? Well, let me tell you, they've gone to root behind a tree. That's right, they bloody, yep. That's the premise of the movie, that's it. And then, oh no, Chloe is pregnant. And that's where the tagline of this film comes from. One bone can change everything. Because for some reason, they feel compelled to kind of stay together for the sake of the dogs. So they can kind of like co-parent and get through this whole pregnancy thing together. It's a bit of a stretch, obviously, but you know, it's a comedy. I personally didn't like this film, but I definitely think that there's an audience for this out there. I didn't at all like any of these characters and the runtime felt really stretched. It felt more cringe than comedy, I'd say. These dogs are also unbelievably well behaved. They are two of the most wooden actors I've ever seen in my life. Honestly, they should feel ashamed about their performance. But who shouldn't feel ashamed about their performance? Uh, Grant Gustin and Lucy Hale. Honestly, they are really, really good actors in this. I think they're really talented, and I think overall the film was shot pretty well. I think that maybe this was one of the better films that I watched in this marathon, so I'm gonna give it a 5.5 .5 out of 10. Yeah, so that's... <laughs> 
that's kind of what we're looking at here. Ah, uh, yeah, no, nah, I didn't like that. I didn't like that one. The next film I watched was One Up, which is an eSports comedy. If you're new here and you don't really know my background, I'm a bit of a gamer. I wasn't super excited about the idea of an eSports comedy film, but thank God BuzzFeed had a list of 17 reasons that I should be excited for the film One Up. I was very thankful to hear that these gamers wouldn't feel fake AF. I was so full of hope, but little did I know that these gamers would feel fake AF. All right, yeah, th this hasn't been a, a great start. I don't know what I just watched. Uh, as the film opens, it immediately assumes that you know nothing about esports, which I think was a really good start. <laughs> Vivian is at a regular college on an esports scholarship, and her lecturer for video games history class is Ruby Rose's character, who has a name that I didn't write down. She's giving a lecture kind of about what video games are. However, she's interrupted in her lecture when she mentions Lara Croft. Croft. Laura Croft is smoking. <laughs> Tits. <laughs> Look, am I a little upset that there was a character named Todd who was sexist? Yes. Am I more upset that he never again shows up in this film? Yes. It's always so exciting when there's a character named Todd in something. But they always make him a dick. I don't know why. But this gives Ruby Rose the perfect setup to do a little takedown piece on Ubisoft. Before saying that video games aren't just for men now, they're for everyone. Gamers are everyone. Even Todd. So that's the overarching message of the film that they have just laid out for us in the first five minutes, which I think is is really good storytelling. So Vivian and her friend are part of the esports team called the Baders, but they're always benched on this team, and also uh, all the other team members are raging sexists. But the only reason you have a spot on this team is because you guys have, have, you know, vaginas. What? I actually, uh, I think it's bulbous. All the dudes aren't bad though. Shout out to my guy Owen. Does he stand idly by and watch his teammates be sexist to every single woman they encounter for almost the entire film? Yes. But if the article says he's alright, I think so too. Speaking of video games, did you know the video game in the film is real? They in the film call it Knights of the Elder Orb, but in real life it was called Fault Elder Orb. I don't know why they didn't just call it its real name. Maybe the game didn't pay the money, I don't know. Seems like a weird choice. The service of this game also shut down about four months after the film aired. Anyway, they end up quitting the team to start their own women-only esports team. For some reason, they want Ruby Rose to be the coach of their team, even though she, she has no esports experience whatsoever. It's just she used to develop video games. That, that's her background. I have no real idea what the transferable skills are there. It's like getting a chef to enter a hot dog eating competition. Like, yeah, sure, it's both food. But what, what the hell they got to do with each other? The whole film feels like it was written by someone who has never played a video game in their life, let alone has any understanding of what esports actually is. Like, to find members for their new team, which they call the 8-Bits, they make a TikTok, where, first of all, they do the Macarena. You know, not exactly the most popular TikTok dance. I don't know if it's all the rage for kids to be doing a dance from 1993. Do you like gaming? Overwatch? I freaking love Animal Crossing, but there is no correlation between that game and esports. Give Tom Nook a gun, see what happens. This is a recurring theme though throughout the film where it seems that they think if you're good at one game, you are good at all games. When they're training in this film, they play literally any and every game that is not the game they're meant to be playing. You could put this down to bonding exercises for the team, but there's so much force conflict in the film that it's like, if these were bonding exercises, they didn't bloody work. So there's this kind of weird implication in the film that one, all skills in video games are transferable and universal, and two, to be good at video games, you also don't need to work very hard. There's more conflicting messages in the film than that. In their first match where they go up against the betas, they get absolutely destroyed. Like, it's not even a competition and they admit that. I get that it's common narrative structure for in a sports film, the team to take a big L at the beginning. But I just feel like it could have been done a lot more tastefully and deliberately than what it was. It just felt like they were kind of checking a box here. Like they should have them lose for a specific reason that they got to overcome over the course of the film rather than just being like, oh yeah, we're not 
very good. While we're on the topic of narrative structure, this film has striking similarities to 2012's Pitch Perfect. Whether it be like the humor or the dynamics or the characterization, even the whole scenes in this were just giving me like crazy deja vu. Even the article that we were talking about earlier mentions this. Like BuzzFeed themselves takes note that this is derivative of Pitch Perfect and it's not even taking the stuff that like aged well from that film. Now there is an absurd amount of video game references in this film, but not in the kind of way where you look at it and you go, oh yeah, they know their stuff. It feels like they were more running down a checklist of things that they needed to include in the film, whether or not it made a lot of sense. They were really trying to shove it in wherever they could. When I fell off Rainbow Road, you know what I said? I said, like I do, I don't even need another life. There's references to the Konami Code, Rainbow Road, Leroy Jenkins. There's also even a major plot point around swatting. Early on in the film, there is like a little montage of the main character running to the lecture that she's running late for. And they kind of incorporate all these little video game references here. I actually really liked this. I thought this was going to be a recurring thing in the film. But this is the kind of only instance of this. And I think that's like a big shame because I think this would have been a good way to reference video games throughout. Obviously I understand that there's budget restraints but there are definitely other parts in the film where they could have taken the budget from. I like this and I think this aesthetic works better than just shoving in a all your base are belong to us mug that is pointed directly at the camera. While editing this I realized something that I missed. The reason she's seeing all this video game stuff is because she's on drugs. I didn't realize this. They do this again later on in the film with a Mario like character. I didn't feel like it was worth bringing up at the time because I knew this was a drug thing. And now it kind of, I don't know, it kind of it kind of ruined it for me a bit here. I thought this was creative. <laughs> anyway, I don't know who this film is meant to appeal to. It's not interesting or accessible to a non-gaming audience. And to a gaming audience, it's too frustrating and unrealistic. It's a shame because I do think that the concept of an esports comedy could be good. And I think the messaging in this film is good. It just does a terrible job at doing it. Also, spoilers for the film. Uh, the entire thing ends up being an ad for Mercedes-Benz. They even shoot it like a commercial. It's an honor to meet you. I work with Mercedes-Benz. How would you feel about us sponsoring the team? We're also throwing in a GLA 250 for each member of the team. We're in. <laughs> wasn't even for anything video game related. Could they not put in a video game sponsor or something? Why did it have to be a car? What's this got to do with anything? I could talk about this film for ages, but there is a lot more to cover in this video. So we're going to end it here and I'm going to give this film a 3.5 out of 10. While it was really cringe, I did get some enjoyment out of this. Now, because every second we get further away and subsequently closer to Christmas, I thought there was no better time to watch the film Xmas. A rom-com where the title definitely came before the premise. Graham Stroop is a game designer working on a really boring looking game which has a deadline of Christmas Day. Oh no. So because of this he tells his family that he will not be home for Christmas. However, later on in the scene he decides that he is going to go home for Christmas. So he goes home for Christmas. He then discovers that his family invited his ex-fiance in his place because they all like her so much. Now because she dumped him, uh, he feels a little messed up about this. He's not super keen on her being there and he's worried that she is going to replace him in the family. So he decides to make her look bad and he does this by getting the family to play board games with her in which she just kind of makes herself look bad. Did somebody mention a game night? Yes. Okay, well I got the supplies. Wait, wait. He's obviously the werewolf. Villager. This is a villager outfit. I swear on the spirit of Christmas. Oh my god, you guys bought it! So gullible! I am the werewolf. How about that? So he really didn't do anything here, but then she's like, ah, I know what you were doing. You were trying to make me look bad. She catches on. So they make a bet that one of them is going to get kicked out before Christmas Day. And whoever remains in the house gets to keep the family for holidays forever. They go about this by kind of ruining Christmas for everyone. This is a rough watch. He is definitely played like the bad guy in this film, but she is unequivocally, indubitably in the wrong. Like, what the hell is she thinking? Go, go home! 
Go home. Go to, go to your family. What are you doing? This is wrong. Leave. His family in this movie are also just really callous towards him throughout the majority of it. So everyone is really unlikable and the plot is just complete nonsense. It's overall a very shallow film that's meant to capitalize on, you know, the Christmas movie market. Also, the really easy to see moral of this film is hammered twice into your skull in one scene. I hated this film, but it's... It's like a four. It's it's just probably a four. It's a four, but it was less enjoyable than one up. If if that makes sense, I don't know. Maybe this rating system's not making a lot of sense. Next, I watched Fall, which, as you might remember, was the film that initially got me looking into BuzzFeed Studios in the first place. And it definitely seems like this was the most talked about of the films. Okay, I liked that. I liked Fall. It's a film about heights, and I bloody hate heights. If you bloody hate heights, don't don't look for this bit because there's gonna be footage of heights. On the positive side though guys, don't worry, it's not real, alright? It's a video, you won't fall. Uh, this film is about three climbers. This film is about two climbers. After the death of her husband in the footage that you just saw, Becky is depressed, but her friend Hunter convinces her to climb a 2,000 foot tower on the anniversary of her husband's death to spread his ashes. When they reach the top, they become stranded. In terms of plot, that's all I'm really gonna say about it. I, I enjoyed this film, it was surprisingly good, and I don't want to spoil it that much. This is the only film on the list that I would probably recommend to someone in a non-ironic way. It's maybe a little slow in parts, but there's enough twists and turns and anxiety-inducing moments to keep me interested throughout the majority of the film. Apparently, to give it a PG-13 rating in post, they edited out all the F-words, which I find to be extremely odd for such a graphic movie. There's a lot I'd like to hear narrative-wise, and Jeffrey Dean Morgan's in it, uh, so I give this like a 7 or a 7.5 out of 10. 7.5. Let's do 7.5. It did a really good job with a small budget. This is one of the few films that they released theatrically, and it was a box office success, so they are working on sequels. I don't know if it really needs that, but, you know... Okay. My Fake Boyfriend I Saw was one of the better critically reviewed films on this list. So I do admit when I went in for this film, I, I had higher hopes. I'm ready for death. Look, I'll give them this. I do think so far all the films have been entertaining. I think that's the best we can say. It stars Keenan Lonsdale, Sarah Hyland, and Dylan Sprouse. Uh, Dylan Sprouse is not the Riverdale Sprouse. The general plot for this is that stuntman Andrew is in a relationship with one of the actors of the show he works on. His name's Nico. But this guy's a scumbag and he's He's always cheating on him and stuff, but Andrew always seems to get back with him. So that's when his friend Andrew and his girlfriend Kelly come up with a devious plan. They essentially create a fake boyfriend for Andrew to keep Nico away. At first this kind of works great for everyone, it keeps the ex-boyfriend really jealous. The fake boyfriend also starts getting a following and starts becoming like a kind of celebrity. However, when Andrew meets someone who he believes might be the real love of his life, the fake boyfriend obviously kind of gets a little in the way. Now, right out the gate here, I do want to say that I really did enjoy the main cast, like the three main people. They're really fun and they got a really good chemistry. Jake and Kelly act as these kind of crazy kind of cartoon characters, I'd say, which makes for a fun dynamic. One thing I didn't like about this film is that the main characters maybe come into too much conflict with each other. And my favorite aspect of the film is the chemistry. This kind of ruins it for me a lot when the characters aren't getting along anymore, especially when they're kind of like betraying their their own characters that they set up in the first 30 minutes of the film. Also, this film is absolutely riddled with product placement. It actually is like a little bit of a plot point in it, so in that way it's kind of forgivable. But like, come on man, why is BuzzFeed gotta keep advertising BuzzFeed in their films? Plot is also really stupid all round, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it kind of does feel, at least to me, like there's two different movies going on. You've got one film, which is Andrew and his relationship, and then another film, which is Dylan Sprouse and whatever the hell's going on with the fake boyfriend. They do kind of make it a plot point that Andrew doesn't really have anything to do with the fake boyfriend, but I don't think it works very well. It wasn't very good, but it knows it wasn't very good, so I'm gonna give it like a 5 out of 10. I did get some enjoyment out of this one. I watched the shark film from my bed. And I'd do it again. Not watch the shark film again. I meant, I meant watch a movie from my bed. The Black Demon is a film I'd seen recently on a lot of streaming services, and it comes across as your typical shark film, 
which it kind of is. Paul, who is an oil rig inspector, is sent to a small Mexican town to look at an oil rig. He brings his family along for the trip, and what used to be a nice holiday destination is now a kind of derelict, crime-ridden town. He leaves his family on the shore and heads off to the oil rig, but his family are forced to flee the town soon after. They gotta run from some nasty men. I don't know what is said at all in this scene here. Neither of the streaming services had the Spanish translations on the screen. So there was a whole bunch of dialogue in this film that I, I, I just don't know what it was. <laughs> they speak quite a bit of Spanish in this. The bad guy definitely comes across as sus, like Red the Imposter from Among Us. When Paul gets to the oil rig, he's met by two workers and their dog and they like brandish weapons at him for some reason. I guess they think he's a shark. And the rest of the family gets to the rig and then a shark eats the boat. So now they're trapped on the oil rig and they can't escape. Otherwise, they will be the meal of a very angry Megalodon. It's not your average Megalodon though. It might have been sent by a very angry god. And also it can cause hallucinations. And the oil rig is also set to explode. So th there's a lot going on here. Now returning viewers of the channel would know that I bloody love a shark film. However, this one is maybe a little slow and predictable, which is kind of a weird thing to say about a film where a shark can cause hallucinations. It's also really heavy handed with the message. The shark itself is very inconsistent. Pretty much every character in this movie is super frustrating. And I know it's a little weird to critique the shark film on realism, but this guy definitely should have got the bends. I'm not gonna mark it down for that, but that just bothered me. I give this a very generous 5.5 out of 10. I'd give it a much higher score if more stuff happened in it. This one definitely felt like the kind of film that you should watch with friends and not by yourself in your bedroom. This was a bad idea. And the worst part about this is that no one, no one told me to do this. This is the hard part. No one has told me to do this. I'm just doing this. No one asked for this. I could stop at any time. I'm not going to bloody do that. Am I? The Book of Love is a rom-com that stars Finnick from The Hunger Games as an author who nobody likes. Womp womp. He writes love stories that focus around celibacy, abstinence, chastity, and not banging. And nobody wants to read that. We want to read sexy. Apparently only two people have bought this book, which immediately turns out to be alive because he finds out that it's a bestseller. His publisher shows him an article which is conveniently on BuzzFeed and tells him that it's number one. I knew people in this country had taste. It's not I this country. It's not this country. It's Mexico. In Mexico? What the heck? What? What? I don't know why the hell he thought that this was number one in his country, considering the article he was just passed was in Spanish. Uh, but whatever. That is definitely not the worst writing in this movie. You can probably tell already, this film is wildly inconsistent throughout. So his book was translated to Spanish by M. F. Rodriguez. For some reason, he assumes is a dude. Uh, but wow, who would have guessed it? Women can be translators too now, guys. I bet you didn't know that. It's a fun fact. He also has no presence on social media, so no one knows who he is. So he's got to get his ass to Mexico and do a press tour while subsequently also trying to increase his follow account online. So he gets there and he meets the translator and her family. And once he gets to the press event, a shocking twist is revealed. The translator added banging to the book. It's raunchy as hell now, and that's why it's so popular. So the movie is kind of about him losing his values and his artistic integrity, and learning to work with the woman who changed his heart all for the pursuit of the big bucks. And maybe they just might fall in love along the way. I'm trivializing it a little bit here, but that is the gist. Uh, there's a lot of problems with this movie. It is wildly inconsistent. The romance stuff surprisingly feels a little out of left field because the main two cast members have next to no chemistry for almost the entire film. Also, the same extras keep showing up throughout the film. At one point, I thought they were meant to be recurring characters, but sometimes they speak English and sometimes they don't. So I think they're definitely meant to be different characters. There's about four or five moments in this film where they use the same same featured extras. Maybe this is the deliberate choice and maybe this is a budgetary thing, but it definitely took me out of it a bit. Also throughout this film, there's a lot of references to telenovelas. So I think they do utilize a lot of the prevalent tropes from that. However, I don't know dick or balls about telenovelas. So I'm probably missing like a lot of nuances to do with that. So maybe the thing with the extras is a reference to that. Or maybe it was more of a COVID restriction thing. Uh, when I was looking at the Wikipedia article, I saw they had some issues with COVID restrictions. But yeah, overall, this was a rough watch. I really didn't enjoy it. I'm gonna give it like a three, although I think maybe strangely I would recommend
recommend it to like watch with friends or something like that. I would say it's kind of bordering on the bad funny border. Don't quote me on that though, all right? If you don't enjoy it, don't come at me, all right? I gave it a three. I just watched Dear David. How can you be so creatively bankrupt when the story was already done for you? Why did they do that? So this next film, Dear David, was truly a baffling experience for me. I briefly mentioned earlier in the video that this film is based on a series of tweets that an ex-employee of BuzzFeed made in 2017. This employee is Adam Ellis, and you may recognize his work. He is a pretty successful artist, and these tweets were about a real-life haunting experience that he was having at the time, or so he says. It was an ongoing storyline that was happening over the course of months, and he was constantly engaging with his followers at the time. So they were kind of able to interact with the story. Now, I'm a huge fan of horror, and it's probably probably my favorite genre, but I can safely say that this was one of the worst and most disappointing horror films that I've ever watched. I have so much to say about this film, and I know this video is gonna go for a long time as is, so I think I may make another video specifically about this film, because it is truly fascinating how bad this is. I'm still gonna give a little review of it now, I'm not an asshole, but I am probably going to make a video about that soon, so if that sounds like it interests you and you're not subscribed, please subscribe so you, you get notified about that. I promise this wasn't my intention going into this video, I thought I would just include it here, but again, I have a lot to say about it. When this film opens, it states that it is based on the true events of what happened to Adam Ellis while he was working at BuzzFeed. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the director of Poppy Love was one of the creatives behind the original commercials, so you may think with something like this, they would bring Adam Ellis on board, as he was the original storyteller of of Dear David. However, apparently, according to him, he had literally nothing to do with this film, and it really shows. I'm gonna give this a 3 out of 10 because it's not scary, it's not interesting, it somehow does a disservice to the original work, which again, were a series of tweets. In a similar vein to One Up, it's got that kind of vibe of like, my dad trying to explain the internet to me, where he doesn't quite get it. The characters are incredibly frustrating, to the point where it almost feels like the character of Adam Ellis is a personal attack on the real Adam Ellis. It is so weird, man, but on the positive sides, some of the effects look pretty good, uh, Justin Long's in it, who is, you know, an icon, he's a scream queen. And it probably did have my favorite scene out of any of the BuzzFeed films. If you've already seen the film, it's the scene with the BuzzFeed list article, which I definitely can't show a clip of in this video. So the next two films I've kind of lumped together a bit, and that is Stop and Go and The End of Us. And the reason I've lumped both these together is because uh, they are two comedies based around the COVID pandemic. So out the gate here, they do feel a little bit dated. I think most of us are a little sick of this premise at this point, and jokes about that kind of feel a little cringy at this point. You know, the premise is so done to death, but I do get why these films were made. Both of these released in 2021, so probably the creatives behind them, uh, when they wrote these films, were in the COVID pandemic themselves. Also, it makes things a lot easier to film in COVID restrictions when the movie you are making is about COVID restrictions. So yeah, I'm sure at the time when the films were made, they were kind of insightful and humorous, but now, yeah, they didn't age super well. The similarities between the films doesn't end there. For example, a theme in both the films are characters coming to terms with hitting the age of 30. And they both feel very low budget. Again, that's not a criticism, it's just more of a, a note. I almost fell asleep in that one. In, um... Oh, pfft, end of Us? I almost fell asleep in that. The End of Us is kind of a comedy romance breakup drama. It features a couple, Nick and Leah, who break up kind of as the COVID pandemic is starting. And because he's a struggling actor slash writer, he doesn't have a lot of money, so they are forced to kind of quarantine together. The whole film is how they navigate and deal with that. And overall, not a lot happens in this movie. There's no real strong plot. It's more like a product of the times, you know, like a, it's like a slice of life. It honestly, and I think I would have had this thought, you know, even if I didn't know that the film was made by BuzzFeed, it really plays like a really long version of one of those like relatable skits that BuzzFeed would make eight or nine years ago. For the most part, this guy in the film is super unlikable and annoying. And I get that's kind of the point, but I don't necessarily think that means that it was good. Overall, I think it was a very charming film, but as we get further from the pandemic, the less 
I relate to it or find it engaging or interesting at all. But even then, if we were in the pandemic, I don't think it really offers anything insightful anyway. So I'm going to give it like a four and a half out of ten. I don't know why I thought leaving the two COVID-based comedies to the end was a good idea. Stop and Go, I definitely preferred a little bit more, and that's because not only is there a premise to the film, but there's also a plot. There's a more physical dynamic journey going on. It's two sisters who are going on a road trip to save their grandmother from a nursing home where a COVID outbreak has taken place, and they're in a race against time to get there before their sister does, who is currently on a cruise ship. Although this film struggles a bit because we are, again, you know, removed a bit from the pandemic, I do genuinely think that this is a fun concept for a film. One thing that I didn't like is that majority of the film feels like it takes place in the car. Kind of drags on a little because of this it almost feels like a lot of these scenes were improv one thing i really did appreciate about the film is that this was the only one out of all 11 films that didn't feature a major conflict between the two main cast members it was so refreshing in this way that it was kind of legitimately a more feel-good kind of movie as i've talked about in numerous of these films a lot of the times when there is conflict with the main characters it feels forced like they're checking a box and I think this film shows that, you know, you don't need to do that. This film would have no benefit adding that to it. So because of that, I'm going to give it one point over the previous film, which I think was 4.5. So I'm giving this 5.5. Like, I didn't like it, but I didn't... I didn't hate it. But speaking of hating something, we're on to our final film, One True Loves. I don't know if it's just because that was the last one, but that absolutely felt like the worst one. That was terrible. I just wanted to yell at these people. This is a bit of a weird one. It's a romantic comedy drama based off a novel. A lot of this film is out of order. It jumps around in a weird non-linear way that makes it confusing and hard to identify or have an emotional response to any of the characters. Essentially, there's this woman named Emma and her husband, Jesse, dies in a helicopter accident. Over the next four years, she falls in love with Simu Liu's character and they get engaged. Fun fact, they filmed this after Shang-Chi. Why'd you do this, man? Why'd you pick, why'd you do, yeah. Surely you had better options. Anyway, so they're gonna get engaged, but, oh, geez, surprise, the original husband actually survived the helicopter crash, and he's been stranded on an island for four years. So she's gotta decide whether she wants to go back with Jesse or stay with the man that she's loved for the past four years. She ends up going with Jesse to a cabin to work things out while Simu Liu stays at home. Now out the gate for this film, I did call it a romantic comedy, but that's not exactly true. None of anything we've talked about so far has been played for laughs. It's all been very serious. But during this middle portion of the film, Simu Liu is in a romantic comedy. The other two characters are in a very serious drama. Also, the premise for this film feels stupid. Like, in my mind, there's not even a question here. Stay with the guy you've loved for the past four years. This other dude needs therapy. He needs serious help. Stay away from him. Stay far away from this guy. Leave him alone, dude. Leave him alone. You're putting him through it right now. You are confusing the poor man. Also, in the intro of this film, they flash the exact same Expedia ad at you about five or six times. I'm I'm watching a movie. Why am I getting ads on their webpage? I was thinking around the midway point of this film uh, that not a lot was happening. So I thought maybe a crazy twist was going to happen where it was going to be revealed that maybe he'd like killed and eaten people on this island or something. But other than like one bad dream, he seems to be adjusting extraordinarily well. From what could have been a pretty funny or thrilling or interesting concept, they kind of just left us with nothing in this film. I'm sure this out of order narrative storytelling works really well in a novel where you get to know exactly what people are thinking and feeling. But in a movie, that doesn't work very well unless you, you're extremely talented at, at, at conveying these kinds of things. Because what ended up happening is I just, I just didn't care about anyone. I think maybe for me, this was one of the least enjoyable of the films. It feels wrong to give it anything below a three though. But yeah, from the tone and, and the narrative jumping everywhere, uh, this film was dull as hell. Honestly, I fully expected these films to be much worse than they actually were. But in reality, for the most part, uh, these films were pretty mid, which I think 
in in my honest opinion, is kind of worse. I really love a garbage film, like a proper dumpster fire, and none of these films were really that. None of them were so bad that they were like funny or entertaining. They were all very middling, and that kind of makes a boring experience. I almost quit doing this challenge several times because of how boring it was, and this was pretty early on in doing it. It was just overall a really mind-numbing experience. I think final thoughts for this whole thing was that I don't know if anything was that bad, but none of it was good. Oh, Fall. I liked Fall. I think they need to put less focus on getting films out and more focus on making them good. Like, they've released 11 films in three years. I'm pretty sure that's more than, like, Warner Brothers. Maybe have a focus on quality over quantity, which... You know, maybe it's a bit weird to say to BuzzFeed, but, you know, there you go. Given, you know, given their hi history. I hope I can turn this into a video, otherwise I've wasted so much of my life. If you've made it to this point, please hit like, I really appreciate it. This experience sucked, and I don't recommend that you do this. Also, if you've made it to this point, please subscribe, especially if you'd be interested in seeing that video about Dear David, let me know. Any ideas for videos in general, uh, let me know. Any weird movies you think I should watch, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give anything a go. Uh, until then, see ya.